Good evening, all, and welcome. Tonight, I have a very special announcement. Even though I have put my previous line of merch to an end, I have now launched a brand new line of merch for you to potentially indulge in. And to celebrate Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday and stuff, I have a discount code for all my merch right now that is available. It's at the top of the description, so feel free to punch it in for these next four days to enjoy a festive discount, if you care to have some. Thank you. I would also like to thank Deadly Cure for joining us in tonight's video. But for now, it's time to get comfortable, grab your drumsticks, and let the darkness take control. And happy Thanksgiving, everyone. October 20th, six years ago, I came home from class at around 11.30, and no one else was home. I hung out at home for a bit, and at 2.30, I was overcome with sleepiness. Being the bum that I am, I lay down in my bed and set a timer on my phone for a 20-minute nap. I fell asleep quickly, and after around five minutes, I was awoken in my bedroom to the door opening and had a split second of a panic before my dog jumped up on my bed and laid down next to me. Then, I fell back asleep. After another five minutes of sleep, I instantly jolted awake because I was certain that there was someone standing next to my bed behind me. I assumed it was my mother, who would be likely pissed that I was sleeping in the middle of the day. I awoke and turned around in one movement, and there was no one. I checked my phone, and had another eight minutes of sleep. I went back to sleep only to be woken up by my phone ringing. It was my mother. She said that my great aunt, who had been in the hospital after a stroke-like event for a week, had died at one o'clock. My mum then said that she knew my aunt was gonna die today because she had seen a wraith, a sort of ghost, a warning that someone was going to die that very morning. My mum is Scottish and very superstitious, but I don't believe any of that. She said that when she woke up in the morning to take my brother to school, she went into my room to see if I was still asleep, and she saw a wraith standing next to my bed. It was at that point my brain crapped itself. So, back in 2017, I decided I'd had enough of the lifestyle I was living. I had finished university, but hadn't got anywhere with my degree, and decided a change was necessary. This change came in the form of moving to France to do a winter season, and test my luck at snowboarding. Myself and an old friend quickly found jobs at chalet hosts, and relocated to Chamonix, France. Our little apartment was based at the bottom of Mount Brabant, and we shared this with three other girls. For a bit of context, the layout of the apartment meant that me and my friend shared a room. Then two other girls shared the opposite room to ours. And then the final girl, who was also acting supervisor, had her own section of the apartment, complete with a separate kitchen and bathroom to the ones we four shared. After a few weeks, my friend got a boyfriend and began staying at his place most nights. Once this started, I began having odd dreams in these dreams I'd be flying around the room backwards, able to see myself asleep on the bed, but not able to slow down or control myself shooting around the room and under the bed and back out again. This was a little scary, but I was smoking a lot and just put it down to lucid dreaming. I'm familiar with astral projecting, but again, just thought it was from the smoke. On one of these nights while zooming around my bedroom asleep, I saw that there was a shadow in the corner of the room watching me while I slept. When I looked back down at myself, I saw both my legs raised in the air in an awkward position. I quickly woke up and found that my legs were actually in that position. This creeped me the hell out, as I'd never experienced anything like this before. Creepy, yes, but not the scariest part yet. One night, my friend was staying at her boyfriend's, as was one of the other girls, and the supervisor was out having drinks at her friend's. 
The other girl from opposite me, let's call her Charlotte, had gone out for a drink, but due to having an early get up the next day, decided to come home at around 11 p.m. This was a decision she came to regret. So let's skip to the following morning. I woke up after a great night's sleep and was coming out of my room to go to the bathroom. Before making it in, Charlotte swung open her door in floods of tears. I mean, this was a girl I'd only known a couple of weeks, and we were not at the point of feeling comfortable enough to cry to one another, so this did catch me off guard. I managed to calm her down to the point of being able to speak coherent, which was when she told me everything that unfolded that night. This girl would have gained nothing from making up such a story, not to mention the crying. She explained that she was asleep, and in her dream, she got a bee stuck in her hair, and the buzzing was so intense, it woke her up. Only, the buzzing didn't stop when she awoke. As she scanned her room for the source of the sound, she saw a woman stood at the foot of her bed and blocking the door. Initially, she thought that my friend had come home drunk and stumbled into the wrong room, but after calling her name and her eyes adjusting to the darkness, she realised this wasn't the case. Instead, an unknown woman glared down at her. She began shouting at her to leave, but the woman simply crossed her arms and smirked mockingly at Charlotte. After a few moments of being mocked, she plucked up the courage to lunge at the light switch, which was to the side of where the woman was stood, and as if by magic, she disappeared. Charlotte was understandably shaken up at this point and left the light on to try to control herself, only this wasn't the end of her waking nightmare. With the lights on and sat up in her bed, she watched as the blanket began to pull off of her. This happened continuously. Every time she would pull the cover back up, it would be pulled back down and eventually would be pulled completely off of her, landing at the other side of the room. She explained how she was frozen and spent the rest of the night sat up in bed with the lights on, crying. During this period, she heard laughs of mocking and just waited for the moment she heard someone else wake up in the apartment. This being me. She later told me how she was sensitive to ghosts, with this not being her only experience. She spoke of a time when she was younger, and would tell her mum about the boy in the wall in her house. Her concerned mum arranged for a priest and a psychic to visit the house, where it was discovered that a boy had died in the property, and his remains were found in the walls of the house. They had to get the police involved, although it was determined that the body was a hundred plus years old. Her family home was a converted nunnery, and there had been reports of lots of abuse happening within the covent. Her mum later paid a visit during the season and confirmed all of this. Least to say, I was scared by these events, even though they didn't happen to me directly. I spent the rest of the season in fear of the next time I would be in my apartment on my own, not wanting to meet the ghost lady. After this, no one witnessed any more strange occurrences, despite us being there another five months after this happening. The most that happened was hearing a door slam shut, which I quickly brushed off as the wind, even though no doors or windows were open. I was under the belief of not giving it any more attention, in the hope that it wouldn't fuel it to do any more. We spoke to our boss, who owns the property, and although concerned at what we had seen, he did express that no other season heirs had mentioned anything of the sort happening. I thought about this for a long time after, wanting more answers as to who this woman was. The only explanation I could come up with is that around a ten minute walk away from our apartment, there was a cemetery. In this cemetery, there was a wall dedicated to all who had lost their lives exploring the mountain. These were individuals from all over the world who had come to this area to explore the mountains, but weren't lucky enough to make it back home. 
I believe this woman was an English explorer who had lost her life there and was drawn to Charlotte, not only because she was sensitive to these things, but also because the woman was trapped in a country where few would understand her to communicate. Either way, this was a scary experience to all involved, and has only piqued my interest in the paranormal further. I have had several creepy experiences. I'm going to start from the one when I was in college, in my bedroom. The building was modern, and so I was more caught off guard. I guess you expect ghosts to be chilling in some old stone building and whatnot. I lived in Lincoln, UK, which is a fairly historical city. I was laying in bed at night, grinding shinies on Pokemon Diamond, when out of the corner of my eye I saw movement. I looked up from my white DS, and at the end of my bed was a figure, a woman in all black, just staring. I stared back, silently, my brain frozen over. Without looking away, I felt for the light switch and hit the light. For some reason I assumed that this would make it go away, but it didn't. I shouted, jumped out of bed and ran. My housemates were all awake in the living room, and they were super concerned. We went back to my room and there was nothing there. I got mocked for the rest of the year. Roll on four years, I'm living on my own in China, Nanchang. In the winter, it gets cold and lonely. Being the social butterfly that I am, I decided to buy a bird from the old pet market. The guy gave me a fairly good deal on a majestic baggy. I don't know what her English name is. He assured me that I would be able to teach the bird to talk. Lol. It didn't take long for the bird to become used to me, and eventually would happily sit on my head, hand or shoulder, but would never talk. I named it Bromir, after the most important character in Lord of the Rings. As winter went on, things started to get a bit strange. One night I was sitting watching Arrested Development, when all of a sudden the bird began to laugh. Not that weird, right? Everyone laughs at Arrested Development, but this laugh was creepy and it was high, and then got low. A moment later, there was a banging on my door. I opened it, and a man started shouting at me. I had no idea what he was saying, and then he barged into my flat. He walked over the balcony, one I had never even bothered to open, and started shouting stuff at me. I walked over, and even though it was locked up, it was flooded. An outside tap was fully turned on, and the water was pouring all down the side of the building. He had to go and get a key. Turns out he was maintenance, opened the balcony and turned the tap off. It took a while as the tap had been twisted so tight it was stuck. In the background, Broamir just laughed. The second time I heard this laugh, I wasn't alone. Another foreign teacher from Holland was sitting with me. We were both drinking whiskey and listening to music, when suddenly the laugh began again. We watched as the knob of the stereo turned on its own, first all the way up, then all the way down. At the time, I didn't make a connection with the laughing and the weirdness. We were both pretty unnerved. One night, I brought a girl back with me. She was scared of birds, so I put Bromir in his cage and covered it with a thick blanket. We went to bed. I closed the bedroom door and she got a headache, and we went to sleep. I could hear the bird laughing through the cage and through the wooden door. We woke up to banging on the door. This time it was the bedroom door. Someone was in my apartment. The girl started to panic, in ways that only girls do when there's an intruder. So I grabbed something heavy and went over to the door and pulled it open. At first I thought there was no one there. But then I looked down. Bromir was at my feet, staring silently. The girl didn't come back. At this point I decided the bird had to go. I put it back in the cage and found a friend who'd said he'd take it. The final night before he left, I was in bed, and I heard the laugh again. It filled me with dread and waited for something to happen, but nothing did. I fell asleep and woke up in my bedroom to the door slamming. And I woke up. There was someone in my room. She was speaking to me in a very hurried fashion, but there was no sound. She wasn't like the scary Lincoln lady. She was scared. She ran out of my room and I followed, hitting as many light switches as possible, and then she was gone. The birdcage was empty, but I could hear the laughter coming from my bedroom. I went back in, and sitting on the top of the lamp was Broimir. 
I didn't sleep that night. The next day I took him to my friend's place. I had told him everything honestly, as I'm not that much of an idiot, but he was still eager to have the bird. And this is the part of the story that seems the most far-fetched, but I swear down it happened. I gave the bird to my friend, and as I was about to leave, a little voice in my head said, I miss you. <laughs> in the end, the bird escaped from my friend's house a few months after that, and was never heard from again. Probably for the best. In November of 2017, my new girlfriend, who's now my wife, and I, had only been dating a month when we took our first weekend getaway. We live in southern Illinois, and drove about five and a half hours to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to see Ruby Falls, the giant underground waterfall attraction, and Rock City, Lookout Mountain. Both great attractions, but unless you live within seven hours, or are just passing through to another great location for a day or so, I really wouldn't recommend making a family vacation of it. The area is mostly pretty, and my lady and I, being the stoners we are, of course love a picturesque cityscape, especially with mountains present. We were only in Chattanooga for about a day overall, as it was dark out when we got there Sunday evening. We really only had time to go to dinner. The next day, we went to the aforementioned attractions, and the last thing we did, as it was getting dark soon, was to go to Rock City, where they have this weird, completely dark cave area that is full of glow-in-the-dark fairy tale creatures and classic story characters. It's truly trippy, to be honest. A surreal visual experience. But instead of taking our time looking at the individual sections of the exhibit, like we had planned, my wife was now very insistent that we leave Tennessee as soon as possible. She wouldn't tell me what was going on, but something in her eyes said it was all very wrong, and being new to the relationship, and not wanting to upset her, I grabbed her hand, and we rushed out of there. We grabbed a coffee and dinner about halfway back home, when she told me that she felt an evil, angry entity present where we were in the cave exhibit, and that it was so overwhelmingly negative that we had to leave. While I didn't feel that myself personally, I will say it is a weird place to say the least, so I kind of dropped it, and we made our way back home around 1am. We showered and went to sleep about half an hour later, as we were very tired from the whole weekend of travel. Now, here's where the experience actually occurred. About an hour or so after falling asleep, I suddenly awoke to the very dark feeling of dread, like everything in the world was wrong, and it was the same feeling that I had when I saw my wife's eyes earlier that day in the trippy cave exhibit. I closed my eyes and tried to ignore it, when in my mind's eye, I saw, or even now I'll admit possibly imagined, a horribly skinny charred black arm, with a hand that had only three fingers, with razor-sharp black claws, reaching up from under the bed and reaching for my wife. It was so real that my heart started pounding, and I was absolutely terrified. That's when my wife let out the most horrifying scream I've ever heard in my entire life. And then, she jumped out of our bed and ran for her life, and was almost to the front door of our apartment when I finally grabbed her and helped her to get control of herself. I've never seen so much fear and horror in the eyes of someone I've loved before. She told me right there that there was no way we were staying the night at our place that night with what happened, and I agreed. It was very late, but I called my parents, and they let us sleep in the guest room at their house. After I got my wife to calm down and go back to sleep, I privately told my dad what happened and what I saw, and him being the very religious man he is, said that what was attacking us was certainly a demon, and the black three-clawed arm was meant as a mockery to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This shook and unsettled me. 
For another two years, I kept what I saw that night to myself, until when my wife finally brought it up one day, and told me she felt something very evil, with sharp nails, reaching out and grabbing her from under the bed. I finally confirmed my side of the story to her, because up until then, she was under the impression that it was her alone that knew what was going on that night, and she was mortified when I finally told her. We're both glad we're no longer in that apartment, and we agreed that while we never needed to hear each other's side of the story to know what happened exactly as it occurred that night, it definitely helped us grow as a couple to have that horrible experience. Two years ago, my family had our first Christmas at my grandmother's house, since my great-grandfather had passed away. There was a definite somber tone to the otherwise festive gathering, as he was a big part of our family get-togethers. Fast forward a few hours into night, my uncle, who was a bit of a disturber with a twisted sense of humour, started poking fun at silly things my great-grandfather used to do. It began harmless, but of course he took it way too far and started making fun of pretty rude things, like the fact he had a hard time chewing his food near the end of his life. Pretty horrible, I know. As soon as the statement left his mouth, the craziest thing I've ever experienced happened. My grandmother has a bookshelf in the living room where we were all situated in. One of the shelves, the second one from the top, was almost a mini shrine to him. Well, everything on that shelf went flying off, literally shot across the room and fell to the floor, as if someone had thrown it. The weirdest thing was nothing on any of the other shelves were touched, just the stuff on the one dedicated to him. No one was beside the shelf and there were no windows open. Needless to say, my uncle was scared and bolted out of the room as we were all stunned. I have no logical explanation for what happened that night, but we do like to say it was our grandfather telling my uncle to smarten up one last time. It's important to note that this activity started when my father tried to readjust to civilian life after leaving the military. He eventually turned to drink and this is when the activity started. He also became physically abusive to my mother. Halfway through the events I list here, my mother had a restraining order put on my father and kicked him out the house, but the activity continued. This occurred between the age of four to eight years old, so over the span of four years. My childhood story goes as follows. It started when I was four years old. The first incident was when my aunt and cousins visited my house. We were all in the living room, then I needed to use the bathroom upstairs. So I went into the hallway and saw a dog. It looked like a Doberman. I thought my aunt had a new dog, and I went into the living room to ask. I was excited to see the dog. My mother and aunt looked at each other in surprise, searched the house, and in the end, I was smacked on the butt for lying. The dog vanished. The next morning, my cousin said she saw the dog when she was in the bathroom in the night. It was downstairs looking up at her. When my mum was home alone, she was cleaning the kitchen and saw the dog in the hallway. She opened the front door and told it to get out and leave. It went out of the door and we never saw the dog again. Then, sometime later, when I was eating cereal before school, I would tell my mum the cereal tastes funny. I didn't know about sour milk then. The issue was, our milk was delivered fresh every morning by the milkman, and our neighbour's milk was fine. Also, fresh fruit would start to rot and turn brown within a few hours of being in our kitchen. A further development was the handle of our kitchen door to the outside would shake at night. My father went down to check and held the door handle. It stopped, and then, when he returned upstairs, it started again. Then, the next step was I started to become scared and feeling fear in my bedroom. I was too scared to sleep in there alone, so I would go into my parents' room to sleep. One night, 
We had a New Year's party, and I was put to bed with my cousin, Alex. He was a tough kid, local bully. We were both in my bed in the dark, and I heard him start to cry, and he asked if I was awake, and I said yes. He said, there's a shadow man in the corner of my bedroom, watching us, and he screamed and shouted his father. Our fathers came up and took us downstairs where the adults were celebrating. Then, they all left soon after. I never saw a shadow man. I only felt scared and fear in the bedroom. At this point, my father was kicked out of the house. One day, my half-brother visited me when I was playing with our neighbour in the park. My mother took me to the shops with her and told him she'll be back in 30 minutes with candy. My brother saw my living room blinds move from the park and thought me and my mum returned with the candy. He went into the house with a neighbour and found the TV on, radio on, gas fire on full power, in the middle of summer. Me and my mum returned to find them waiting in the park, too scared to come into the house. I learned the next part later in my life when my mother opened up to me about it, as she hid this from me until I was 20 years old. The final incident that happened that forced us to move was my mum was hoovering my bedroom. Inside the bedroom, there was a large storage compartment with a door that leads into the walls. The door was fully closed when she entered the room. She turned her back to the door when hoovering, and she then felt pure evil behind her. Something very negative. She turned around and saw the door fully open, so she dropped the hoover and ran to the garden screaming. My neighbour, who was a retired police officer, jumped over from his garden to see what happened. She said there was something in the house, but he misunderstood for someone in the house. He got his old police baton and isolated the electricity from the outside to turn off the hoover that was still on. By this time, my mum was in his house with his wife having a cup of tea and an emotional breakdown from it. He said there's nobody inside, and she said no, there's something in the house, not a person. Then they explained that when me and my mum were on vacation in England with my future stepfather, the lights in my room would turn on and off all night long with noises of footsteps. The neighbour checked it out with his flashlight and baton and his dog Toby, thinking it was my father coming back whilst we were away. The dog would growl at the door and not enter the house. The neighbour inspected the house, but he found nobody. Then, when he returned to his house, the footsteps and lights would start again. So they would decide not to tell us because they didn't want to scare my mum and me. They kept it secret. Soon after, we moved to England. The best experience I had that connected me back to this was when I started my career at sea. I was on a container ship sailing around Asia, and I had multiple deep dreams of being in this old house with several other people of different nationalities, trapped in the large old house. It had red wallpaper, lanterns on the walls and oil paintings of people with very high ceilings. It looked very Tudor, 15 or 1600s. I could always interact with these people until it came. We would all be paralysed and thrown around the large room we were in, and I'd wake up paralysed, unable to move, cold sweat in my bed, on the ship, until I'd break out and free myself. The fear I felt was the same as in my childhood bedroom back in Scotland. The final dream I had, I had an interaction with it. I dreamed that I was in a pitch black room with a circle of light around me, that I was safe in. To the left of me were lightly lit wooden stairs leading up to a door with a light piercing through the sides of it. The entity called my name in a croaky voice and laughed, sounding like an old smoker's voice. It told me to come into the dark and join it. I fought back and told it to get lost and that I'd never be like you. 
and I called it a pathetic piece of crap. It quickly responded with a, come with me now. I told it no, and then ran for the stairs. I got to the door, and I felt my right leg being pulled. I kicked multiple times back into the dark, on my pulled leg, and I felt it contact against something. I got through the door, and I was in this house I had seen before in my dreams. I saw the red wallpaper, the lanterns, and oil paintings. I then woke up, but this time, free, not paralysed. Deep down, I feel that the voice I was talking to was what was in my room back in my childhood home. Since then, I have had a couple of other dreams in strange houses. Feeling a presence, but never back at that old Tudor house. When I was 13, I woke up one night to the sound of children laughing out my window. I had an 11-year-old brother who had friends next door, so I thought nothing of it. It happened a couple of nights in a row, and so I told my little brother to knock it off, or I'd go all big brother on him and noogie him or something. He gave me poker face and said he could hear them too, but I figured he was being a dork. That night I heard it again. I got up and opened the window to yell at him and his friends, and all I saw out of my window was the darkest, blackest silhouette I've ever seen. There were four or five of them, about the size of a toddler. As soon as I screamed, they vanished. Dad went outside to see if he could see anything. Of course he didn't. I heard them twice since then. The first time I bailed and slept in the living room. The second time I got balls enough to look outside again, and they were there. I went to a 70s horror movie preacher and held up a Bible and screamed, In the name of the Father and the Son, I command you to leave and never return. And they never did. I'm guessing it's because they were too busy laughing at me somewhere else. I've had two paranormal stories about things that have happened in my life that I can't explain. But this is the most recent. I used to be in the Navy, and in 2016 to 17, I was delighted to be posted to Singapore on an overseas posting. To make matters better, I was to find out that I was taking over the job and the associated house from my best friend, a fellow Navy classmate. I was incidentally posted to a ship that visited my friend in Singapore in 2015, and I had been there numerous times before, so I was familiar with the country. What I experienced in the house we ended up living in, though, I still can't wholly explain. To set the scene, the housing we were in was on a historic patch of military officer housing to Singapore's north. The locals fondly refer to these houses as black and white, and they are held in high historic esteem in Singapore. Noting land is at a premium in Singapore, we were very, very lucky to be given one to live in. The houses were built in the 1930s onwards, and were originally used to house British officers and their families. The Japanese took up residence in the houses when they invaded in World War II, and many local people were killed in the area under the then brutal Japanese invaders. Accordingly, the suburb is said by superstitious locals to be haunted, and I had many an interesting discussion with taxi drivers about that very same topic on a number of occasions, where they would come and pick me up from the house. This is a picture of what the houses looked like. Note that it's not the exact house I lived in, since there are still military families living there, but it is basically identical to the house we lived in. Rewind to 2015, when I mentioned that my ship was in Singapore to visit for an exercise. At this point, I had no idea that I would be getting posted there in 2016, but I was excited to be getting some R&R after a long stint at sea. My friend who was heading back home for a wedding offered me the keys to his house, which a year later became our house, so that I could take advantage of getting off the ship. We caught up for a beer, and then he gave me the keys and left for the airport. He would get home a week later. Taking advantage of our shore leave, my wife decided to fly to Singapore with our three-year-old daughter, so that we could spend the week together. 
I had a day or two in the house to myself before they arrived. The house also had a live-in maid. She lived in quarters down the back of the house, but she had returned home to visit family for a week while my friend and his family were back home. I had the house to myself. The first night in the house, I watched some TV and then decided to go to sleep. I had the spare room which was down the right wing of the house. I remember lying in bed feeling agitated and distinctly remember the atmosphere feeling very heavy. I also had the feeling I was being watched from the door. I couldn't shake it. It was just a feeling of something being off. I put it down to being the first night in a new country and the first night in an actual bed for a few weeks. Still feeling strange, and like something was watching me, I eventually got to sleep. My wife arrived the next day, and we had a ball catching up as a family. We put our daughter in the room next to us, down the same wing, and went to bed later that night. Around 2am, my wife and I were both woken up by the sound of someone running down the hardwood floors of the house. We both sat upright and looked at each other, summarizing that it was our daughter up and about. I told my wife I'd go and check on her. Imagine my surprise to walk into her room and find her completely asleep. The kitchen in these houses is at the back of the house, and in the kitchen is generally a back door that leads downstairs to the ground level where the maid's quarters are. To let Breeze through, we left the back wire door open while we were in the house. While pottering around one day, I looked to see my daughter staring quizzically at the door. Note that due to the angle I was at, I couldn't see the back door. I could only see my daughter. She looked sheepish. So I asked her what was wrong. All she would say is, Daddy, there's a man with bananas. I asked her where, and she pointed to the back door. I walked into the kitchen, and no one was there, either in the kitchen, at the back door, or even downstairs in the backyard. A day or so later, my friend rang to see how we were going. I mentioned to him about the weird things that had occurred and feeling like an idiot, I asked him if he thought the house was haunted. He went silent for a bit before uttering, Between you and me? I suspect yes. Julia, not his wife's real name, doesn't believe me though. Doing some later research, imagine my surprise to find out that that part of Singapore used to be a banana and rubber plantation in World War II. Imagine my friend's greater surprise when, at a US military function, a month or so later, one of the other officers mentioned jokingly that his kids kept talking about the old man with bananas on his back in the neighborhood that no one had seemed to see. It might have been possible that this guy was the spirit of an old guy who used to go to the house selling bananas back in the day. Fast forward to 2016, and we found out that I was to be taking over from my friend in Singapore. We were overjoyed, and thought nothing about living in the house. The area was beautiful, and the posting was going to be a great life experience. We moved in, and everything was pretty quiet for a month or two. My mother-in-law came to visit, and one day, while standing in the kitchen in uniform, Something very strange happened. I was talking to her when I felt something land on my head and run down my back mid-conversation. Pulling frantically at the back of my cam tunic, I watched dumbfounded as a coin from my country dropped onto the floor. Noting we'd been in Singapore for two months by this point, I hadn't carried any coins from home at all. In fact, they were all in a drawer in the dining room. There was no way the coin could have sat lodged in my jacket for two months either. It got washed every few days. My mother-in-law just looked at me, speechless, as we both saw it happen, and we couldn't explain it. 
Our maid, who had been at the house for about three families before us, would not stay in the house at night. On the rare occasion where we asked her to babysit, as soon as we got home at night, she couldn't get out of the house quick enough. She swore black and blue that the house was haunted. I befriended another overseas officer, and he and his wife used to come over quite a lot. He confided in me that she didn't really feel comfortable in the house, and that she always felt like she was being watched if she went to the toilet or walked through the house. One of my wife's friends, who was also in the Navy, had her ship visit Singapore, so of course we invited her around for dinner. After retiring to the lounge room to just catch up and talk, we noticed that she kept looking over her shoulder into the darkened dining room and adjoining kitchen every now and then. After a few more times of doing this, my wife's curiosity got the better of her and she asked her what she was looking at. After some coaxing, she told us we wouldn't believe her. She confided that she could sense spirits. She also mentioned that her sister could see spirits, but she didn't have the same level of ability, and that there was someone standing in the dining room. We asked if this person had bad intent, and she said, no, not at all. They are just there and I get the feeling that you share this house with them. Nonetheless, we were creeped out. Also bear in mind that this woman was the commanding officer of a warship. She's not the type to be prone to flights of fancy. Some other minor things happened, but it all came to a head a few months later when I invited a lot of the guys from work over for a barbecue. We had people of all nations in our backyard, and accordingly, their kids and ours were playing upstairs in the house and in the backyard all day, and everyone was having a ball. That night kicked off some of the weirdest activity that I can't explain to this day. Tired, we put the kids to bed and went to bed ourselves. Not long into bed, I hear the front door downstairs slam. I go down and check it out it's locked. Soon after that, the kitchen taps come on full. I turn them off. About half an hour later, all the lights in the living room areas come on. I turn them all off and go back to bed. My wife and I literally utter, what the hell, ten minutes later, as they all come back on again, lighting up the house. Feeling like an idiot, I stand in the living room and yell, if there's someone else here, can you please stop it? You're scaring our family. We can all live happily together. The activity stopped. As a side story, family who came and stayed with us, and who stayed in the same spare room, would report that the drawers in that room would sometimes be open when they went to bed at night. Weird. Fast forward to the end of our posting. We had done the removal, and I was in the lounge cleaning the kitchen at around 9pm, a few days before we left the country. We were staying in a transit house just a few doors down. As I was cleaning the last of the benches, I could hear someone distinctly walking around the spare room wing of the house. That was the last straw. I grabbed the keys, locked up, and dropped the keys off to the housing officer. I swear this is all true, and I still can't explain it to this day. I never felt like the house was oppressive, but there was certainly something off about it. As a funny aside, as part of the handover with the guy taking over from me, I mentioned some of the weird goings-on, and told him to be alert but not alarmed if anything happened. He completely wrote it off and told me, I don't want to hear about that type of crap. I don't believe in it. I'm led to believe that a few months later, he and his wife had a median come and inspect the house. I have no idea what they experienced, but it was evidently something. There were other weird stories that went on in our neighborhood, bearing in mind that the estate or patch that we lived on 
was all old Allied military houses from World War II, and the suburb accordingly saw a lot of heartache as local workers who worked for the Allies were killed by the Japanese invaders. Accordingly, most Singaporeans we met went to great pains to tell us that our suburb was haunted, and that this was well known around Singapore in general. Firstly, bear in mind that these stories were things that were experienced by other military officers that lived in our neighbourhood, often senior military officers from Australia, US and New Zealand. So, they are people of sound mind and not prone to telling tall tales. First off, I'll tell you a story from my direct workmate at the time. A guy we'll call Bruce. Bruce's boss lived in our patch and had a reputation in contravention of his senior military officer persona, for always being late to most things. Anyway, we're driving home from the Singaporean base one day, and Bruce's boss calls him and asks if he can stop around his house to help him move some furniture, adding that he'd be home in about 15 minutes. Despite me offering to help, but not wanting to get me caught up in his boss's time vampire-esque ways, Bruce dropped me home. Bruce headed to his boss's house, and finding no one answering the door, rang his boss to check where he was, apologising profusely, and to Bruce's total lack of surprise, his boss told him that he would just be another 45 minutes or so, and that Bruce should help himself to a beer under the house and kindly wait. Nearly all of the old houses had an entertaining void deck at the bottom of the house, Nearly everyone kept a beer fridge and furniture down there for entertaining guests, etc. So sitting down with a beer on a hot Singaporean afternoon with the fans on wasn't the worst of outcomes, albeit inconvenient. Anyway, a bit miffed, Bruce grabbed a beer from the fridge under the house and sank into the cane furniture to wait. A few minutes later, Bruce said he heard the sound of multiple footsteps walking around the house on the floorboards above him. Realising that someone was home, and remembering that his boss had his father, mother, and brother visiting for a week from back home, Bruce opened the front door and went to walk upstairs to ask if he could wait inside where it was cool. Bruce said he craned his head and looked upstairs from the foot of the front door stairs. He distinctly heard two men talking in a serious manner upstairs, and not wanting to intrude on their conversation, and noting he had a beer to enjoy, he shut the door quietly and waited back under the house. About 15 minutes later, the housemaid came up the driveway with groceries, and in her ever-friendly voice said, Mr. Bruce, sir, are you here to help sir move furniture? Why are you waiting downstairs in the heat? You should have let yourself in and sat upstairs in the aircon. Bruce stated that he was going to, but heard his boss's family talking in the house and didn't want to intrude. The housemaid turned white and said, Mr. Bruce, his family went to Universal Studios this morning, which was on the other side of the island. No one has been in the home all day. Bruce again swore that he distinctly heard footsteps and voices in the house. Sure enough, she and Bruce went up inside the house to check, and no one was home. The house was quiet as a tomb. This guy had served in war zones, and he still can't explain it to this day. Here's the second story. One of the Kiwi families told my wife that she suspected that something funny was going on in their house, as over the course of a few months, the milk in her fridge would sour within 24 hours of her buying it. Bearing in mind that these houses had a few fridges, she started moving all her milk to the downstairs beer fridge. Nope. Like clockwork, the milk would sour in there too. On top of this, every few days, she and her husband would wake in the morning to find wet human footprints in their kitchen and hallways. They lived alone. Another story we got from one of the American families regarded the time one of the wives' husbands had to go to Diego Garcia for a work trip, leaving her at home in Singapore by herself for a week. There was only her, her husband, and their dog living in the house. She joked that her dog had a bee in its bonnet about her husband, and would always annoyingly bark up a storm when he came home from work each afternoon. 
about five days into the trip. Imagine her surprise when she hears her dog start going nuts one morning. She then hears her dog's bark go from his usual playful barks to meek whines. Sitting at her computer, she heard the front door downstairs swing open and her husband distinctly yell out, Hey honey, I got home early, but I just have to do some stuff back at the base. I'll be home later this afternoon. She thought it was a bit weird and made it weirder by the way the dog was acting, but yelled out, Oh, okay, welcome home, uh, see you later. The afternoon went by, and soon it was 4pm, then 5pm, then 6, then 7. Getting a bit annoyed because by this stage, she was preparing them both dinner. She rang her husband and asked when he was planning to get home. He answered somewhat confusingly, that he was still in Diego Garcia and wasn't due back for another two days as originally planned. She swore she heard his voice as clear as day. Interestingly, the dog was extremely clingy and didn't leave her side for those two days until her husband got home. Here's the final story. Most of the housemaids in Singapore are either from the Philippines, Malaysia or Indonesia. Our maid, who I mentioned had worked for four families before us, she was a legend, was from the Philippines, and had lived in the suburb working for nigh on 11 years. We were talking about the suburb over coffee one morning, and mentioned the weird stories that we had been told about. Also, bear in mind that this was the same maid who hated being in our house after hours, and would quite rightly, retired to her apartment down the back of the yard as soon as she could. As a side note, she often would take our kids to her little apartment if we had to attend an after-hours function. She disliked the house at night that much. Anyway, some of the houses neighbouring us were empty from time to time, what with the usual movements of military families and all that. You got used to it. She told us that one day she invited one of her friends over for a coffee, and they were sitting at the base of our back stairs, just outside of her quarters, and shooting the breeze. As per Singapore tradition, it was teeming with afternoon monsoonial rain, and flashes of lightning were occasionally lighting up the sky. As a side note, our suburb in the north of Singapore was one of the most lightning-struck places in the world, we personally blew two TVs, a home theatre system, and a computer while living there. Surge protectors did nothing. She swore to me that she and her friend looked at one of the empty houses, and saw a lady, dressed completely in white, standing in one of the upstairs windows, staring across at them. The house was completely empty, and was actually undergoing planned maintenance or renovations at the time, in preparation for another family. No one had access to it accordingly. Bear in mind, these last stories were told to us by people I would consider to be of impeccable character, and occurred while we were posted there. With regards to the first story, Bruce became a very good friend of mine, and he still can't explain what happened at his boss's house. There were a few other weird instances that happened. Taxi drivers often had interesting stories about the suburb, i.e. swearing they saw figures walking around at night. But these were the main ones that really stuck with me. Okay, so I've never particularly considered myself a believer of the paranormal. Nor am I a complete skeptic. I mean, I turn all the lights on to go to the toilet if I've watched a scary film, or been reading some decent paranormal stories. So I must believe at least to an extent. Bit of backstory, my dad lives in the Scottish Highlands, has done for the last 20 plus years, and I drive the 14 hour round trip to visit as often as possible, two or three times a year. I've always loved this journey, especially if I'm by myself, as there's around two to three hours of motorway, followed by back roads through the mountains, through forests and around locks where I can put my music on and pretty much just switch off. For the most part, there's little to no phone reception, so I generally download a couple of playlists before I go, 
put my phone in its holder and blindly follow the sat-nav until it loses signal. I've been doing this journey for years, so really I have no requirement for the sat-nav, but I love to try and beat the ETA. It can also be quite handy when it has signal to let me know if there are any accidents or diversions ahead. Anyhow, on this particular journey, I was coming home. I had set off at nightfall, as there's far less traffic on the overnight journeys, and less chance to get stuck behind holiday makers, especially caravans. I hate caravans. I was travelling south, in January, and the weather was something else. My car showed an outside temperature of minus 12 C, or 10 Fahrenheit, and the snow barely stopped. It hadn't stopped since I arrived at my dad's house, four days earlier. My wipers were on full speed, but still the snow kept piling up on my windscreen, meaning I had to drive around half my usual speed. Every now and then, there'd be a short break in the snowfall, and everything just looked magical. It was like driving through a Christmas card. Looking down into the valleys, everything covered in a thick white blanket, and lit up by the dim glow of the overhead moon, making it possible to still make out the river weaving its way through the cracks in the deepest crevices, reflecting what little light there was. On these roads, there's nothing in terms of lighting, and what's worse is there can quite often be a large drop on either side of the road. Couple this with three to four feet of fresh snowfall, and an inability to see any of the road, and you've got the potential for a lot of accidents. In order to combat this, there's eight foot high sticks on the side of the road, with reflective tape at the top, red on one side, white on the other. Drive between these, and you should be okay. So I was driving and driving. The snow just hadn't given up, and I was focusing on the red and white reflective tape to keep on the road. Up ahead, I saw the dim tail lights of another car, a welcome sight as it was the first I'd seen in over an hour. Everyone else must have known that it was a bad idea to be out in this. Instead of focusing on the reflective sticks, I was now focusing on the tail lights of the car ahead. I couldn't quite work out what make or model it was, a lightish, white or light grey SUV of some sort, holiday makers. I thought this because I could make out their roof box and bike rack. They too must have ignored the warning signs to not drive tonight. When I sped up to try and make some ground between us, it seemed to speed up too. If I slowed down, they slowed down too. The space between us remained a constant. I decided that my headlights must have been annoying them in their rearview mirror, so I kept the distance as it was, blindly following their lights whilst being mindful to try and keep my tyres in the most shallow bits of snow on the road, avoiding the occasional snow mound. A bit of time lapsed, I have no idea how much, as I had now switched off entirely, listening to my mix of 90s old school dance the howl of the wind and splat of snow on my windscreen, and in between wiper swishes, watching the red lights ahead of me glow in the dark like the eyes of a demonic beast, intent on keeping its distance. I noticed the car ahead start to take a turn off the road and felt a sudden sense of sadness and loneliness. I was losing my travel buddy, the only other sign of human life I'd had for the last few hours. I then realised that, having been so intent on following the car in front, I had no idea where I was, which isn't an issue. I essentially just had to stay on the same road for three hours until I reached a fork in the road, turn right, and then onto the main road and see a little roundabout. Bizarrely though, my sat-nav now just displayed lost GPS signal, and had me as a dot on a white background convenient as everything was covered in snow. It never did this. It had usually downloaded enough of the route to at least keep the map on screen. It was then that I got an overwhelming urge to follow the car ahead. I knew I shouldn't. I literally had no turnings I needed to make off the road, and I really didn't recognise the road they were taking. And the more I think of it, 
I've never noticed a turn-off that goes down the side of the mountain like this did, but maybe I just never looked. I decided to follow it. Of course I did. If I ever think I shouldn't do something because it could end up in regret, I'll probably do it. Although, as I neared the turning, I started to doubt myself and thought I should stay on my road. But no matter how much I wanted to keep the wheels going straight, my hands and body wouldn't allow it. I turned off. I didn't recognize this new road. I didn't recognize the old road when I was on that either. So it really made no difference. Everything was white. Everything was dark. Lots of trees and the reflective sticks. If anything, it looked exactly the same. Like I hadn't turned off at all. Ten to fifteen minutes later, the car ahead started pulling away from me. Only slowly, but faster than I wanted to drive in these conditions. So I let it. It couldn't really get away anyway, as there was nowhere to go from this road, so I figured I'd see it again shortly. Another ten minutes or so passed of driving alone, and then, in the distance, I spotted lights again, and this time I was catching up, quickly. The lights were flashing in the dark distance. Amber, nothing, amber, nothing. Great. My travel buddy has got their hazard lights on, and they've stopped. I decided I'd have to pull over and see what was wrong. As I pulled up behind my buddy, a white Audi, possibly a Q3 or Q5, I'm not sure. I noticed the amount of snow on their car. Surely far too much for them to have just stopped. And there's no tyre tracks for me to pull into. But it was 100% the same car I'd been following. I came to a stop, just as a woman in a big blue coat ran to my window waving her arms. I'm not the most empathetic of people, but it didn't take much to read the relief on her face and see that she had been crying. She had had to pull over because she'd had a puncture, and then explained that she had been waiting there, unable to call anyone as there's no signal, and thought she'd have to wait until the morning before she could leave. She had had her ignition on while listening to music and tried to keep the DVD player running for her little one, pressing the heated seat button each time it turned itself off until it wouldn't come back on. Her battery had died. I thought she was being a bit dramatic. It was literally only a few minutes since she pulled away from me. She can't have been here that long. Over four and a half hours... That's how long she said they'd been there. Over four and a half hours sat in her car with her 18-month-old child, in minus 12 C temperatures, with no phone signal, food or drink, and no way to heat the inside of the car up. So this wasn't the car in front of me for the past two hours. But it looked exactly the same, even down to the dark grey roof box and bike rack. Coincidence. A big one. But that's not all I can logically think. I suddenly felt angry. Angry that the car in front of me hadn't stopped to help. Maybe they thought I would. That's a bit presumptuous of them. I asked her if she had tried to flag them down. A look of confusion or concern spread across her face. She told me that there hadn't been a single car go past while she had been there. But I've been... I stopped myself from going any further, from explaining that I'd been following a car that didn't exist for over two hours. She was scared enough from being sat here in the dark for the last few hours. I jumped out and looked in her car. Assisted by the light from my headlights, I saw her little one was fast asleep. I asked her if she wanted some coffee from my flask, and she said yes. I knelt down in the snow. She'd already tried removing the nuts and had left the wrench on the floor next to the wheel. It was covered in a layer of snow and freezing cold. I jacked up her car, removed her tyre and replaced it with the pitiful space saver from the boot. I lit a smoke and pulled my car next to hers, connected the batteries and instructed her to start her car. 
once it came back to life, we stood and spoke. I asked her where she was going. Sterling, she replied. Brilliant, I'll follow you. Again, I thought. That's my route. She thanked me for helping her, for talking to her and for calming her down. She thanked me for the coffee and gave me a quick hug, quick enough to be meaningful, short enough to not be overly awkward from a stranger. She got in her car and set off. I got in my car and I sat for a moment staring at the all too familiar tail lights of the white greyish SUV with a roof box and bike rack lit up a smoke and set off. I sped up, caught her up and slowed down. She pulled away. Her speed remained a constant. I kept wondering how she didn't see the other car. The other car that was exactly the same as her car. I kept wondering how I now knew where I was. But yet, we had not turned off or turned on to any other roads. As we neared the civilization of the A-Roads, I started to become aware of the tracks left by my new travel buddy, the tracks in the snow left by their tires. The tracks in the snow that I'm 99% certain were not there when I was following her, or the other her before I stopped and offered her coffee. The snow eased as we entered a town called Kilmerhog. We reached a junction, and she turned right, I turned right. We were now driving in sleet, wet snow that leaves a dirty grey and brown slush on the ground, wet snow that makes seeing much harder than normal dry snow. As we approached the roundabout, she indicated left for the first turning, I indicated right for the last. I pulled alongside her, she looked, waved goodbye, and left. Someone or rather, something, took me that way that night, diverted from my normal route, made me feel as though I had no other option but to follow that car, guided me to a stranded woman and her child, in freezing conditions with no food, water, or heating. I'm still unsure how to explain it. I've not really thought about it too much. I don't like not being able to understand things or give them a logical explanation. It makes me feel uneasy. Ironically, I was in quite a dark place at the time and remember thinking that I could easily drive off the road and it would be days until my car was found. Nothing like being alone in your own thoughts, eh? This ghost car gave me something else to focus on. The woman and child gave me a bit of an uplift. I don't remember being fearful at any point, more unsure and cautious, although that could well have just been due to the driving conditions. I certainly never thought too much about the paranormal. I've always presumed if the paranormal was real, it would present itself to me if it needed to. If not, I'd live in blissful ignorance. But now I don't know, and to me, that's worse than knowing. I'm currently reading through all of my old diaries from ages 11 to 22. I came across a night in question in the middle of an entry. When I was 12, my mum couldn't find a sitter for a late night meeting, so I had to go along with her, with my younger brother and a friend, Mac. We had to keep to ourselves. It was in a church at night. Naturally, a cemetery in the back was where we decided to play. My entry goes that we were in the cemetery in the dark. I screamed and hid behind a gravestone to scare them. My brother taught us a ritual to bring out spirits. You stand on a gravestone, say, may rise ten times, and I stood on about six different stones and did them. Then I was standing on one, and Mac and my brother were facing me. Mac saw something walk towards them and then run. I saw a black, something that was hunched over going behind a tree. My brother saw it too. Then we were up near the church, and I was able to stare at one right next to the tree. I stared for a while. It was moving its head a lot. Then it waved at me. Even Mac saw it too. Mac then said run. But I was left standing on the stone facing my brother Mac and the church, and a wooded area to the right. 
Max said that he saw a tall robed person standing behind a stone after at the back of the cemetery. While we were making out what they were seeing, it appeared to be a few rows closer. They screamed and pulled me off the grave. I fell on my stomach and looked up to see my brother running towards the church spotlight and I followed. I was computing what I thought was a hunched, robed person walking behind a tree within the woods next to our church. At the same time, they were absorbed in the figure behind me. It was very odd. I also want to point out that I completely forgot about the part where we stood under the light and stared at one next to the tree. All three of us stood there in silence for at least a few minutes, and I remember watching its head rotate around the shoulders like a pinwheel so fast it became blurry. It's taken me a long time to come to terms with what happened in my house in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I am finally ready to share. To give a little background, my family, mum, dad, older brother and I, moved to Tennessee in 1995 from Mexico. We moved to a very old ranch-style home in Knox County, and didn't realise that this home would be the site of some of the most harrowing and terrifying experiences I've ever had. I am convinced that many occurrences have been suppressed in my mind, but I want to share with you the memories I do remember. My hand is shaking as I type this out, as these experiences haunt me to this day and are not easy to talk about. The activity in the house first began with the usual paranormal stuff you hear about. Missing items, misplaced or moved belongings, strange creaks and noises around the house. Nothing that can't logically be explained. It wasn't until we decided to add a room to the home, about four or five months in, that it really began to hit the fan. I began to experience unusual things a few times a week to almost every single night thereafter. To give some perspective as to the layout of the home, upon entering, the living room is the first thing you see. To the left is a small hallway leading to my parents' bedroom. To the right of the living room is a very long and narrow hallway that leads to a guest room, then the room my brother and I shared for a short while. The hall ends with a bathroom and the entryway to the kitchen, and extra room directly across from my brother's and my room. Essentially, my room was on the complete opposite end of the house from my parents' room. Anyway, now that the picture is set, I will describe several of my experiences. While my brother slept in my room, I would experience nightly terrors, in which I would see someone standing at my doorway. It would never move, but the only way to describe it was a tall shadowy figure with noticeably long white string-like hair. It would watch me several times a week, and I would feel so terrified that all I would be able to do is cover my head with my blanket and pray it would go away. I told my parents what I had seen after the first night, but they merely chalked it up as me having a nightmare. Typical. Eventually, it got to a point where I began to sleep on my side, with my blanket over my head, with a small opening for me to look through. This continued for two years until my brother got his own room. That's when things really took a turn for the worst. I remember sleeping at night and seeing the same shadowy figure standing at my doorway, feeling just as terrified as the previous times seeing it. I did the usual go-to and covered my face with my blanket, hoping upon uncovering myself, it would be gone. This time was very different. Upon uncovering my face, the same figure was standing in the room, merely feet from my bed. I panicked and covered my head again, wondering if I was going mad. Upon uncovering my head once again, I saw that it had gone, and with a sigh of relief, I turned onto my back. This was not a good move. Upon turning onto my back, I saw the same figure was now floating over my bed on the ceiling. 
I was on the top bunk so you can imagine how close it is now. The only way I can accurately describe this humanoid-like entity is that it looked like a mix of grey alien and a very tall crypt keeper from that one show. The second I saw it, I covered my face once again and felt absolutely petrified with fear. I then felt the figure lay on top of me as I lay frozen on my back. I remember hearing its breathing, sounding like a quiet, almost asthmatic wheeze, and how cold its breath felt. I remember the distinct earthly smell emanating from its mouth as it breathed inches from my face, the only barrier being my blanket. It felt like hours passed, frozen in terror, feeling completely helpless. This occurrence was something that began to happen almost every night, and only happened to me, maybe because I was the youngest. Throughout my time living in that house, things progressively got worse. I would be lying in bed, reading a book with all the lights on, when I would begin to hear scratching under my bed. I would peek under and be overcome with the same paralysis I would feel at night and the feeling of the figure lying on top of me. I would feel it pull me off my bed and onto the floor in the middle of my room and stare into my soul as I kept my eyes closed in sheer terror. My mum would later recount several times in which she would walk into my room and see me lying in the middle of the room on my back. She would ask me what I'm doing, to which I would essentially snap out of it and tell her I was fine, too scared to talk about what had happened. I remember if I slept on my chest, I would feel a force would pick me up two to three feet by my shirt and drop me back onto my bed. This happened so often that to this day, I'm reluctant to sleep on my chest, not because I'm afraid I'll be picked up, now a 220 pound adult man, good luck, but because something in my subconscious mind tells me that it's not a good position to be in. My parents would tell me that I just had nightmares all the time, but they didn't realize that this nightmare was something I experienced every night. Years later, having endured this every night, I began to see an additional apparition in the home. I began to see a young boy in the long stretch of narrow hallway that my bedroom was situated in. I would see him peeking out of different rooms at me while I was in the hallway, only to disappear out of sight into rooms, and then only to see that he had disappeared upon my investigation. That would be the extent of my interaction with him, but I would see him often, and only during the daytime. The apparition did not appear to be malicious, unlike the other figure that tormented me at night. He gave me the impression that he was merely an observer, which was comforting, in a way, that this ghost did not want to mess with me, unlike that Crypt Keeper entity. Over a decade later, now living in Atlanta, I decided to look up the address on Google Maps to show a friend, and noticed that the home was now the site of a home business. Upon seeing that, I decided I would reach out to them out of curiosity to see if they had any similar experiences. The business would later reply saying that they had never had more electronic issues in the home than anywhere they had ever been, and that strange things occurred frequently. He told me that his wife and kids complained about seeing a little boy wandering around the hallway and were scared to live in the home. The man also described seeing a tall shadow occasionally when he was working in his office, which actually turned out to be my old bedroom. He told me he always felt like he was being watched and generally felt uneasy in that room in particular. What is peculiar about this is that I had not described any of my experiences prior to him telling me his, yet our stories appeared to line up. Unfortunately, I've not been able to get information on the house specifically, aside from the current tenant's experiences. 
I do know the area was near the core battleground of the Battle of Campbell Station in 1863. Aside from that, I've been unable to get more information. I showed my parents the message thread I had with this business, and it was then that they confirmed that they believed the house was haunted. They didn't want to say anything that would scare me even more, and tried to bury it under the guise that I was having nightmares. My mother said that she would see the same little boy wandering around the kitchen and hallway, and she always felt that feeling of being watched when no one was home but her. Neither of them had seen the tall figure, and it seemed it was focused on me. I hold no resentment towards my parents. They're just more traditional and didn't really believe in ghosts. They probably handled the situation wrong, but realistically, most parents would have handled it the same, especially their generation. The experiences I had in that home are permanently burned into my mind, and I will never forget that tall, wire-haired figure that constantly picked me up, laid on me, and pulled me around, terrifying me to the core. I don't plan on ever returning to that home, and I pray no one who has the misfortune of living there experiences what I did on a nightly basis for six years. I've always been curious about deep hypnosis and what it may reveal to me, but I am equally terrified to remember events that my own mind deemed it too traumatic to keep in my conscious mind. Hey guys, it's Malt here and thank you so very much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's videos. If of course you did, you can let me know in the usual way. I do always tremendously appreciate it. Um, I would like to again thank Deadly Cure and if you enjoyed his works, feel free to check out more of his content over on his channel. We actually did a video together the other day. I'm going to link it at the end of the video and in the description. And if you liked any of the merch I showcased earlier, remember you get a festive discount. So make the most of it now because the discount code will expire on, you know, I think Tuesday morning, roundabouts then. So, you know, hurry up and use it. All right then guys, huge thanks as always. Also to my lovely patrons, members and coffee supporters, you guys are amazing and I love you. All right then, for now, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a wonderful day with your families if you live in the States or just had a great day in general if you live elsewhere. Stay awesome, thank you all, and I'll see you in the next one.